I'm Jill, Chief Safety Officer with Vivid Learning Systems. I'm a former OSHA inspector, and I'm here to help you identify and correct workplace safety hazards. For this series, we're at the University of Louisville in beautiful Kentucky to show you no matter where you work, safety is for everyone. Welcome to the University of Louisville, Vaccine and International Travel Clinic. Today I'm with Dr. Ruth Carrico, Associate Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases and a Family Nurse Practitioner Board Certified in Infection Control. Dr. Carrico, thank you for being with us. Thanks for the invitation. We are talking about infection control today. And one of the things that employers, I think, sometimes get mixed up on is that complying with bloodborne pathogen laws and protecting employees from bloodborne pathogens is the same as infectious agents, but that's really not the case. So can you explain the difference between the two? Sure. Well, I think when we think about bloodborne pathogens, that really means um, coming in contact with blood or body fluids that contain blood or blood cells. So we didn't really start to think about that really until the really the 80s mm -hmm. uh, and when we began to really become concerned with HIV. Then at that point that kind of changed everything, changed everybody's perspective. But when you think about diseases and transmission, um, transmission associated with blood or body fluids is really only a small portion of infectious diseases and infection transmission. Uh, we all know about influenza mm -hmm. and when that occurs. And so we need to think about, yes, we have bloodborne pathogens, but all of us breathe. Mm -hmm. And so there are many diseases that are transmitted just by the act of inhaling and exhaling. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the larger component of infectious diseases, it really is much broader than simply the blood or blood uh, body fluids. Right, right, right. So there's various workplace settings like uh, emergency medicine and law enforcement and um, hospitals and clinics and dental settings and mortuary sciences and, and uh, lab settings, and they all have uh, potential exposure um, to infectious agents as well. What are some of those core practices that employees and employers um, can implement to protect themselves from infectious agents? Well, I think anywhere where care is delivered, where any time, any place where there's going to be the delivery of health care in, in any respect. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to think about, well, so what type of care is provided? Mm -hmm. What are the, the issues involved in care? What are the risks involved in care? And then we work backwards and we think, okay, what is done in these settings? What are the likelihood of individuals coming in contact with individuals, patients, body fluid, respiratory mm -hmm. um, acts or respiratory secretions, coughing, sneezing, and that, that sort of thing. Then we think about, well, how does that relate to the activities that are involved? And then how can we then protect people from that type of contact? Mm -hmm. Now we know with any infectious disease, there are some basics, some core practices, as you mentioned, yes. that you have to think about those, those foundational things. The first thing that comes to mind always is going to be hand hygiene. You know, these 10 things yeah. are associated with transmission mm -hmm. of infections, infectious agents, pathogens, uh, more commonly than most anything else. So the first thing we want people to think about is, I want to keep my hands clean. The second thing that we want them to think about is, how do I make sure that I don't come in contact with blood or body fluids of another person, another patient, a coworker, anyone? So if I'm talking with students, I'll say, you know, I want to keep this really simple, and that is, remember, if it's wet and not yours, mm -hmm. don't touch, Very unless good. you have some type of barrier precaution. Mm -hmm. That could be gloves or a gown or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the third consideration is thinking about how the environment itself could be involved in transmission. Okay. So it could be a contaminated countertop or a contaminated piece of equipment mm -hmm. and then how we make sure then that those items are cleaned and disinfected before they're used or before they are are contacted by another person sure, right. and so what um, thank you for that what are some of the core elements of an exposure control plan because that's a piece of an employer's responsibility as well right so again we kind of work backwards and we say knowing the type of care mm -hmm. or the contact that occurs between a patient and individual and a healthcare worker, mm -hmm. how do we minimize that? How do we recognize the risks 
then how do we take steps to begin to mitigate or prevent those, those risks? And those things generally happen through several routes. Number one, what are the types of policies and procedures that we can put in place? They kind of guides for what you should do. Then how do we approach this from a human factors, almost an, an engineering right. perspective, mm -hmm. and that how do we make it difficult for people to hurt themselves? Mm -hmm. So in healthcare, some of those examples are safe needle devices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a safety needle. So it makes it hard for me to stick myself or mm -hmm. cut myself. And then how do I then control the environment itself so that it becomes difficult for that individual to become infected or exposed? So we look at all three of the, those programs. But I think, you know, everything requires thought, requires leadership, and requires just some sort of a, of a method because a safe workplace doesn't just magically happen. Mm -hmm. It happens because people come together, they think about what is involved, and then they plan and they say, you know, the number one thing in a workplace is safety, whether it's our, our workers or whether it's our patients. And with infection control, it's implementing the same safety engineering principles that we would for any piece of workplace safety. You mentioned SOPs, which is administrative control. You mentioned safe needle devices, which is an engineering control method. And then, of course, we have personal protective equipment as well. So it's, it's very similar across any piece of workplace safety. Um, what about the role, you mentioned communication. What about the role of communication in infection control? Yeah, it's always funny, isn't it, that we talk about communication very cavalierly, but mm -hmm. that is probably the most important thing uh, that helps then promote the idea of what needs to happen, how do I make sure it happens, do I convey the information, and an act that is so simple, just that simple uh, communication and listening to each other, sharing information, oftentimes uh, is one of the, the, the genesis or the foundation of many of the problems. So communication is critical. I've got to make sure that we understand what the risks are, that we talk about those risks, that we share information, new knowledge as it, as it comes forward. And then kind of, I, I think kind of the basis is recognizing that each of us has a role in safety and prevention and communication. It kind of takes us back to our, our days in Sunday school where we are reminded when we are, are in a workplace, we're really our brother's keeper that it is our responsibility to work together and be concerned about the person that is working alongside us. Wonderful. Dr. Carrico, thank you so much for the information that you shared with us today. Really appreciate it. It's great to have that chance. Yeah, right. So infection control, if you haven't been approaching this in your workplace and talking about it, um, now is the time to start implementing infection control procedures. I hope you gained a safety skill today. If you know someone who needs this, go ahead and pass it on. Safety is everyone's business.